a bottle of ink which only succeeded in whitening. That same day. Or to speak more accurately, that same evening, as Marius left the table, and was on the point of withdrawing to his study, having a case to look over, Basque handed him a letter saying. The person who wrote the letter is in the antechamber. Cassette had taken the grandfather's arm and was strolling in the garden. A letter, like a man, may have an unprepossessing exterior. Coarse paper, coarsely folded, the very sight of certain missives is displeasing. The letter which Basque had brought was of this sort. Marius took it. It smelled of tobacco. Nothing evokes a memory like an odor. Marius recognized that tobacco. He looked at the superscription. To Monsieur, Monsieur L. E. Baron Pomercy. At his hotel. The recognition of the tobacco caused him to recognize the writing as well. It may be said that amazement has its lightning flashes. Marius was, as it were, illuminated by one of these flashes. The sense of smell, that mysterious aid to memory, had just revived a whole world within him. This was certainly the paper, the fashion of folding, the dull tint of ink. It was certainly the well-known handwriting, especially was it the same tobacco. The John Drit Garrett rose before his mind. Thus, strange freak of chance. One of the two scents which he had so diligently sought. The one in connection with which he had lately again exerted so many efforts and which he supposed to be forever lost, had come and presented itself to him of its own accord. He eagerly broke the seal, and read. Monsieur L. E. Baron. If the Supreme Being had given me the talents, I might have been Baron Thienard, member of the Institute. Academy of Sciences. But I am not. I only bear the same as him, happy if this memory recommends me to the excellence of your kindnesses. The benefit with which you will honor me will be reciprocal. I am in possession of a secret concerning an individual. This individual concerns you. I hold the secret at your disposal desiring to have the honor to be useful to you. I will furnish you with the simple means of driving from your honorable family that individual who has no right there, Madame La Baron being of lofty birth. The sanctuary of virtue cannot cohabit longer with crime without abdicating. I await in the Antixumber the orders of Monsieur L. E. Baron. With respect. The letter was signed Thienard. This signature was not false. It was merely a trifle abridged. Moreover, the rigmarole and the orthography completed the revelation. The certificate of origin was complete. Marius' emotion was profound. After a start of surprise, he underwent a feeling of happiness. If he could now but find that other man of whom he was in search, the man who had saved him, Marius, there would be nothing left for him to desire. He opened the drawer of his secretary, took out several bank notes, put them in his pocket, closed the secretary again, and rang the bell. Basque half opened the door. Show the man in, said Marius. Basque announced. Monsieur Thienard. A man entered. A fresh surprise for Marius. The man who entered was an utter stranger to him. This man. Who was old. Moreover. Had a thick nose. His chin swathed in a cravat. Green spectacles with a double screen of green taffeta over his eyes. And his hair was plastered and flattened down on his brow on a level with his eyebrows like the wigs of English coachmen in high life. His hair was grey. He was dressed in black from head to foot, in garments that were very threadbare but clean. A bunch of seals depending from his fob suggested the idea of a watch. He held in his hand an old hat. He walked in a bent attitude, and the curve in his spine augmented the profundity of his bow. The first thing that struck the observer was, that this personage's coat, which was too ample although carefully buttoned, had not been made for him. Here a short digression becomes necessary. There was in Paris at that epoch, in a low-lived old lodging in the Rue Butrialis, near the arsenal, an ingenious Jew whose profession was to change villains into honest men. Not for too long, which might have proved embarrassing for the villain. The change was on sight, for a day or two, 
at the rate of 30 sous a day, by means of a costume which resembled the honesty of the world in general as nearly as possible. This costumer was called the Changer. The pickpockets of Paris had given him this name and knew him by no other. He had a tolerably complete wardrobe. The rags with which he tricked out people were almost probable. He had specialties and categories. On each nail of his shop hung a social status, threadbare and worn. Here the suit of a magistrate. There the outfit of a cure, beyond the outfit of a banker, in one corner the costume of a retired military man, elsewhere the habiliments of a man of letters, and further on the dress of a statesman. This creature was the costumer of the immense drama which knavery plays in Paris. His lair was the green room whence theft emerged, and into which Rogui retreated. A tattered knave arrived at this dressing room. Deposited his thirty sous and selected, according to the part which he wished to play, the costume which suited him, and on descending the stairs once more, the knave was a somebody. On the following day, the clothes were faithfully returned, and the changer, who trusted the thieves with everything, was never robbed. There was one inconvenience about these clothes, they did not fit. Not having been made for those who wore them, they were too tight for one, too loose for another and did not adjust themselves to anyone. Every pickpocket who exceeded or fell short of the human average was ill at his ease in the changer's costumes. It was necessary that one should not be either too fat or too lean. The changer had foreseen only ordinary men. He had taken the measure of the species from the first rascal who came to hand, who is neither stout nor thin, neither tall nor short. Hence adaptations which were sometimes difficult and from which the changer's clients extricated themselves as best they might. So much the worse for the exceptions. The suit of the statesman, for instance, black from head to foot, and consequently proper, would have been too large for Pitt and too small for Castel Sakala. The costume of a statesman was designated as follows in the changer's catalogue. We copy. A coat of black cloth, trousers of black wool, a silk waistcoat, boots, and linen. On the margin there stood ex-ambassador, and a note which we also copy. In a separate box, a neatly frisked peruke, green glasses, seals, and two small quills an inch long, wrapped in cotton. All this belonged to the statesman, the ex-ambassador. This whole costume was, if we may so express ourselves, debilitated. The seams were white, a vague buttonhole yawned at one of the elbows. Moreover, one of the coat buttons was missing on the breast. But this was only detail. As the hand of the statesman should always be thrust into his coat and laid upon his heart, its function was to conceal the absent button. If Marius had been familiar with the occult institutions of Paris, he would instantly have recognized upon the back of the visitor whom Basque had just shown in, the statesman suit borrowed from the pick-me-down that shop of the changer. Marius' disappointment on beholding another man than the one whom he expected to see turned to the newcomer's disadvantage. He surveyed him from head to foot, while that personage made exaggerated bows, and demanded in a curt tone. What do you want? The man replied with an amiable grin of which the caressing smile of a crocodile will furnish some idea. It seems to me impossible that I should not have already had the honor of seeing Monsieur L. E. Baron in society. I think I actually did meet Monsieur personally, several years ago, at the house of Madame la Princesse Bagration and in the drawing rooms of His Lordship the Vicomte d'Ambry, peer of France. It is always a good bit of tactics in knavery to pretend to recognize someone whom one does not know. Marius paid attention to the manner of this man's speech. He spied on his accent and gesture, but his disappointment increased. The pronunciation was nasal and absolutely unlike the dry, shrill tone which he had expected. He was utterly rooted. I know neither Madame Bagration nor M. Dambry, said he. I have never set foot in the house of either of them in my life. The reply was ungracious. The personage, determined to be gracious at any cost, insisted. Then it must have been at Chateaubriand's that I have seen Monsieur. I know Chateaubriand very well. He is very affable. 
he sometimes says to me. Thenard, my friend. Won't you drink a glass of wine with me? Marius' brow grew more and more severe. I have never had the honor of being received by M. de Chateaubriand. Let us cut it short. What do you want? The man bowed lower at that harsh voice. Monsieur L.E. Baron, deign to listen to me. There is in America, in a district near Panama, a village called La Joya. That village is composed of a single house. A large square house of three stories. Built of bricks dried in the sun. Each side of the square 500 feet in length. Each story retreating 12 feet back of the story below. In such a manner as to leave in front a terrace which makes the circuit of the edifice, in the center an inner court where the provisions and munitions are kept. No windows. Loopholes. No doors. Ladders. Ladders to mount from the ground to the first terrace. And from the first to the second, and from the second to the third, ladders to descend into the inner court, no doors to the chambers, trap doors, no staircases to the chambers, ladders. In the evening the traps are closed, the ladders are withdrawn, carbines and blunderbusses trained from the loopholes. No means of entering, a house by day, a citadel by night, 800 inhabitants, that is the village. Why so many precautions? Because the country is dangerous. It is full of cannibals. Then why do people go there? Because the country is marvelous. Gold is found there. What are you driving at? Interrupted Marius, who had passed from disappointment to impatience. At this, Monsieur L.E. Baron. I am an old and weary diplomat. Ancient civilization has thrown me on my own devices. I want to try savages. Well. Monsieur L.E. Baron, egotism is the law of the world. The proletarian peasant woman, who toils by the day, turns round when the diligence passes by, the peasant proprietress, who toils in her field, does not turn round. The dog of the poor man barks at the rich man, the dog of the rich man barks at the poor man. Each one for himself. Self-interest, that's the object of men. Gold, that's the lodestone. What then? Finish. I should like to go and establish myself at La Joya. There are three of us. I have my spouse and my young lady. A very beautiful girl. The journey is long and costly. I need a little money. What concern is that of mine? Demanded Marius. The stranger stretched his neck out of his cravat, a gesture characteristic of the vulture, and replied with an augmented smile. Has not Monsieur L.E. Baron perused my letter? There was some truth in this. The fact is, that the contents of the epistle had slipped Marius' mind. He had seen the writing rather than read the letter. He could hardly recall it. But a moment ago a fresh start had been given him. He had noted that detail. My spouse and my young lady. He fixed a penetrating glance on the stranger. An examining judge could not have done the look better. He almost lay in wait for him. He confined himself to replying. State the case precisely. The stranger inserted his two hands in both his FOBS, drew himself up without straightening his dorsal column, but scrutinizing Marius in his turn, with the green gaze of his spectacles. So be it, Monsieur L.E. Baron. I will be precise. I have a secret to sell to you. A secret? A secret? Which concerns me? Somewhat. What is the secret? Marius scrutinized the man more and more as he listened to him. I commence gratis, said the stranger. You will see that I am interesting. Speak. Monsieur L.E. Baron, you have in your house a thief and an assassin. Marius shuddered. In my house? No, said he. The imperturbable stranger brushed his hat with his elbow and went on. An assassin and a thief. Remark, Monsieur L.E. Baron, that I do not here speak of ancient deeds, deeds of the past which have lapsed, 
which can be effaced by limitation before the law and by repentance before God. I speak of recent deeds, of actual facts as still unknown to justice at this hour. I continue. This man has insinuated himself into your confidence, and almost into your family under a false name. I am about to tell you his real name. And to tell it to you for nothing. I am listening. 